In the spring of 1984, the University of Florida celebrated the 80th birthday of poet Richard Eberhardt. Richard Gormley Eberhardt. He saw his father lose a fortune overnight when a company officer embezzled over a million dollars from the firm. During the same year, he watched his mother die of lung cancer. Five years later, he jumped ship in Port Said to escape a tyrannical captain. He schooled at Dartmouth and Cambridge, tutored the son of the King of Siam, wrote out the Depression teaching at private schools, served as an artillery gunnery instructor during World War II, and later as an executive for the Butcher Polish Company. In 1956, he became poet in residence at Dartmouth. A neo-romantic in spirit, Eberhardt writes poems that speak to the hard realities of the contemporary scene. He fought the usual battles with critics and publishers and won most of the major literary prizes, the Shelley Memorial Prize, the Harriet Monroe, the Pulitzer. Each spring for over a decade, Richard Eberhardt has shared his work with students at the University of Florida. This is a poem called The Theory of Aerial Bombardment. It was written <clears throat> in 1944 when I was uh, in the U.S. Navy as an aerial free gunnery training officer, teaching our young men how to shoot the 50 caliber Browning machine gun at the enemy. And uh, I came home one day in August of that year. I was uh, rather fatigued, and I saw the names of young people like you well, maybe a couple years older, or three, uh, who were already dead in the Pacific. And that really got to me and seemed such a waste of life. You would think the fury of aerial bombardment would rouse God to relent. The infinite spaces are still silent. He looks on shock, pride faces. History even does not know what is meant. You would feel that after so many centuries, God would give man to repent. Yet he can kill as Cain could, but with multitudinous will, no farther advanced than in his ancient furies. Was man made stupid to see his own stupidity? Is God by definition indifferent beyond us all? Is the eternal truth man's fighting soul, wherein the beast ravens in its own avidity? Of Van Wettering I speak, and Averill, names on a list whose faces I do not recall, but they are gone to early death, who late in school distinguished the belt-feed lever from the belt-holding paw. Richard Eberhardt's work has had a significant impact on some of the nation's finest writers and critics, and the program reflected the wide range of this influence. There were old friends Donald Hall and William J. Smith, former students Robert Pack and Jay Perini. Others were new acquaintances, offering poems and critical insights, a reading by Sandra McPherson and lectures by Clanth Brooks and Christopher Ricks. Joel Roach, Eberhardt's biographer, spoke of the unique role which Eberhardt played in establishing the college campus as a legitimate residence for a poet. In the 30s, or before the 40s, before World War II, there are very few poets who are able to get university positions or who are independently wealthy or who in some other way make their living, okay? but very few involved as poets in institutional life. Eliot at Harvard is one ex uh, example of one of the very few. Most of those poets who were involved in institutional life were PhD holding literary people, literary students first, and I can't think of any of them offhand, so I suggest that they weren't particularly distinguished poets. Or you had someone like Stephen Vincent Benet, who is worth more than people give him credit for, but who is still not what we think of in the university setting today as a major poet. With the, and Dick is up against that. He can't get his, his poems published because he gets letter, letter after letter in a file saying we can't afford it in 1934, 35, 36. 
you can't make any money on poetry, therefore we can't publish it. And with World War II, one of the most important things happened to poetry in America in this century is that we won World War II. Uh, and that resulted in a great deal of economic prosperity. It also ushered in an age of even greater technology, which meant a need to expand the university systems. So a great deal of money gets poured into the university systems, and a great deal of that money gets devoted to things like writers in residence, university presses, poetry readings, writers' festivals, all things which both allow the poet to share his perceptions and allow us to, to have the benefit of them, uh, and which make of poetry a semi-permanent part of institutional life and not just something done by a few aficionados who happen to have the leisure to participate. And uh, the, Dick's role in that is just simply that he, was, he lived through exactly that period and had exactly that experience. It's uh, not often that we get the opportunity to celebrate the birthday of a poet, um, but well, we had this opportunity to celebrate the Once a year birthday. for some of us. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, but <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering, uh, since you've known Richard Everhart for some time, what, yep. you know, what recollections you have that you might oh, share have, with us? I have so many, and I'd be delighted to talk about it. I met him first when, uh, I suppose I was about 19, and uh, Dick uh, was there for uh, about 44, I, see, I guess. And he was very much then, as he is now, he was uh, enormously energetic and uh, jolly, and uh, the friend of poets, uh, the lover of poetry, uh, with a wonderful gusto for everything, for other people, for poetry. Uh, he was a salesman at that time for Butcher's Wax, a brief uh, life in the business world, working for his wife, Betty's family in the, the, the wax business. And he used to come into the Grolier Bookstore in Cambridge, Mass., uh, right near Harvard. And he would come in with his little brown leather briefcase toward the end of the day. We started something called the Poets' Theater in those years uh, when I was an undergraduate. And of course, the first meeting to get started to talk about it was held in Dick and Betty's house. Uh, it would be. There were other poets around, but it would be Dick's house. Uh, he was not a professor at Harvard, but uh, we were all close to him. I, I had known his work, of course, earlier. I started uh, reading poetry uh, when I was pretty young, and I found Richard Eberhardt when I was 14 or 15. And uh, then I found him in the flesh, you know, just a few years later. And uh, the wonderful uh, uh, pink and ruddy and energetic flesh of Dick Eberhardt. And I've known him ever since. When uh, he was about 50, he had something which is almost like this. He was teaching at uh, a college in Massachusetts, Wheaton College, and he had a uh, big festival of poets. And he brought in probably 20 poets. Uh, Stephen Spender was there from England, but uh, he was the headliner, as it were. But then there was uh, John Holmes, old friend of Dick's and ours, uh, dead now. I think uh, that Robert Lowell was there. I might be wrong. The Philip Booth. Uh, oh, I was there. All sorts of people. And we were there for two or three days, uh, reading poems, gossiping, talking. Uh, it was sort of Eberhard at 50 as it's now Eberhard at 80. And what is so remarkable is that the man has uh, changed so very little. He hasn't slowed down. In the course of Dick's 30 years at Dartmouth, probably every major English or American poet, I'm sure every major English or American poet that you can name, Dylan Thomas, Wallace Stevens, Robert Lowell, Robert Graves, Edith Sitwell, they all came and stayed at Dick and Betty's house on 5 um, Webster Terrace. And Dick has reminiscences of every single one of them, and uh, it's, it's Do any marvelous. in particular stand out in your mind? If oh, I always remember him talking about how Dylan Thomas came and stayed with him. And uh, Betty is still furious because Dylan Thomas stole one of Dick's best, Harry, uh, best uh, Harris Tweed jackets. He went off with it, and uh, uh, f Betty always has the opposite side of the story from Dick. Of course, Betty is just as generous, but it's very funny to hear them talk about this. What the campus was like. Uh, before Dick Eberhardt arrived was that the, the spirit of Robert Frost pervaded the campus, but Frost wasn't really there. He would come every couple of weeks or every month. He'd be there for a day or two, and you'd sit at his feet and just listen to him. I and mean, that, was, that was very, very exciting, but it was as if 
It was from another world. And with Dick Eberhardt, you know, he was, he was there. He was kind of father and, uh, and, and, and host. So I think the whole atmosphere changed from uh, poetry being something that comes to you from Mount Olympus to poetry that's something that is right there before you and you can sit in the living room of a, of a real poet and he can be interested in your work as well as you're just looking up to his work. Mm -hmm. Now we'll go on to the groundhog. In June, amid the golden fields, I saw a groundhog lying dead. Dead lay he, my senses shook, and mind outshot our naked frailty. There, lowly in the vigorous summer, his form began its senseless change and made my senses waver dim, seeing nature ferocious in him. Inspecting close his maggot's might and seething cauldron of his being, half with loathing, half with a strange love, I poked him with an angry stick. The fever arose, became a flame, and vigor circumscribed the skies, immense energy in the sun, and through my frame a sunless trembling. My stick had done nor good nor harm. Then stood I silent in the day, watching the object as before, and kept my reverence for knowledge, trying for control to be still, to quell the passion of the blood, until I had bent down on my knees, praying for joy in the sight of decay. And so I left, and I returned in autumn strict of eye to see the sap gone out of the groundhog, but the bony, sodden hulk remained. But the year had lost its meaning, and in intellectual chains, I lost both love and loathing, mured up in the wall of wisdom. Another summer took the fields again, massive and burning, full of life. But when I chanced upon the spot, there was only a little hair left, and bones bleaching in the sunlight, beautiful as architecture. I watched them like a geometer and cut a walking stick from a birch. It has been three years now. There is no sign of the groundhog. I stood there in the whirling summer. My hand capped a withered heart and thought of China and of Greece, of Alexander in his tent, of Montaigne in his tower, of St. Teresa in her wild lament. Now, somebody asked me uh, when I read this before here uh, today, how long did it take you to write this poem? And my answer is it took me 20 minutes. And I didn't have to change a word. And yet, at the same time, I wrote three other poems which are forgotten. And yet, this one is remembered. So this one has a perfection of some kind that the others did not have. Now, isn't that mysterious? How could this be? It's amazing. Uh, <clears throat> so I think of poetry as a matter of inspiration or it's a gift of the gods. Or when I wrote this poem, I was at the peak of my being and I was speaking from the whole of my personality uh, and it was grace. It was uh, something given to me. And I've often th gone back to Dick's poems like The Groundhog where you've got a very ethereal uh, kind of poem, but he's constantly returning to this particular grounding, this, these bones bleached in the sunlight, beautiful as architecture. And the poet keeps circling and always coming back to this pile of bones. And, uh, and I think it's the fact that it's rooted in time. It moves over several months. The poet comes back again and again in place that, 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 that allows for the incredible, I think, kind of transcendent beauty at the end of the poem where he says, my hand capped a withered heart, I thought of Alexander in his tent, of St. Teresa in her, of uh, Montaigne in his tower, of St. Teresa in her wild lament. Mm -hmm. Dick has, uh, I think, the real artist's uh, contempt for anything that necessarily is contemporary. Uh, he realizes that the real traditions of poetry are long and eternal, in a sense. And uh, he has gone to school with 
uh, John Clare and, and Blake, and he doesn't give a damn about contemporary fashions. Fashions don't interest him. He's, he has a real voice, and he always writes from the center of his being. He never for a second hesitates or has, gives one thought to whether or not something is going to be in fashion or out of fashion. And that's, to me, always the most inspiring thing about him, that he writes directly from the center of his voice. Yeah, I, I think that is the most important thing to be said about him, is that his love for life and his love for the human body uh, passes over into the energetic quality that uh, he gets into the poetry itself. And uh, I think the main danger for a young writer is to feel that this is in or this is out. Because if that happens, the writer learns only one set of tricks, only one way of doing it, and gets trapped in it. With a model like Eberhardt, there are all sorts of options and alternatives for a young poet. Uh, you can rhyme, you can use meter, uh, you can roughen up the line, uh, you can talk from your intelligence, you can call out from bodily need or emotional passion, so that the whole range of options is, is there. Now, the themes of poetry will very often include death. Uh, life is one long coping with death. Some poets uh, rarely touch upon it, but I think most poets do. Uh, some poets do a great deal. Dick is one uh, in whose work this has uh, come up again and again, uh, from the work he was writing in his 20s and 30s. Perhaps less so as he has come older, I, I come to think, though I haven't done a statistical survey, you know. But uh, this is uh, to be concerned with death, to lament the dead, uh, to call attention to death, is not to be self-destructive. And very often the energy is uh, involved in staving it off, in uh, saying no to it as much as possible, in the, the, in the obsession with it is the uh, counter-movement against it. I think that um, the, the very energy of the uh, syntax and of the uh, thrust of uh, imagery in Dick's poems, which uh, may have to do with a dead lamb or a dead uh, groundhog, uh, is a strong force celebrating life. And that is the way poetry must be. It must have in it conflict all the time. Only um, energy comes only from conflict. Energy never comes from going along in one path and one in, in simply cel celebrating life, saying, isn't it wonderful the lamb is jumping around? That's a very short, very boring poem. But the lamb that was jumping around is now dead. These uh, two principles, the vitality and the necessary end, come together. And they are compounded in the vessel of the poem. And this is what gives the poem its energy and its strength. It was a birthday party like any other. There were presents given, time to reflect and renew old acquaintances, a kiss from the wife. But I suppose a poet's birthday, like a poet's life, is different, particularly when you're 80 and one of the survivors in a livelihood where survival itself becomes an occupational hazard. For Richard Eberhardt, the 20th century has been a tough proving ground for a romantic sensibility. As I listened to him read his most recent poem, I had the distinct impression that after 60 years of writing poetry, nothing is still more humbling than to sit with pen in hand, full of thought and heart, before a blank page. 21st century man. Finally, he decided there was too much pain, the hurt of everything. In youth, it was not knowing. In middle age, it was knowing. In age, it was not knowing. He couldn't figure it out. Would 21st century man do better, or 21st century woman do better either? The tides were always going in or out. But what was the meaning of the ocean? People were either growing up or growing down. He decided to live for sensual reality, pure feeling. After this failed, he decided to espouse pure intelligence. This never told him why he had to die. He then decided to go to the church. But after the supreme fiction of Christ, he thought Buddha and Mohammed had something to say.
Neither sense, intellect, nor religion told him why he was born or had to die, so he began to pay attention to poetry. Non-suicidal, he desired to make something. He decided the greatest thing was a perfect poem. If he could make it, he would be glad to live. The brutal fact, dear reader, as you might suspect, is that he did not make it. Somebody else made his perfect poem imperfect. 